I took a 210 pound woman and threw her through railings. How do you do that? How does a man do that? What was your answer? Whoa, 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 whoa. What was your whoa, answer? Whoa, whoa. If I really wanted money, there was an easier way than trying to combat somebody that's physically stronger than me. Hello and welcome to Here's the Pitch, sponsored by Masses Restaurants in St. Louis. Five locations, stlmasses.com is their website. Of course, check out that website if you're driving through St. Louis and you're thinking about some pasta or you're thinking about Pam Hupp. The thing about Pam, it's become a huge story uh, across the nation after Dateline did their fourth episode on this whole case. And uh, that's why we're here today. I've, I've been following it basically since the fourth Dateline. I didn't really follow the Pam Hub story, even though it happened in my lovely hometown and she's brought wonderful news uh, and coverage to our hometown. But uh, if you don't know about Pam Hub, you should research it. Uh, I would assume you're here because you wanted to see this, uh, this conversation with the lawyer of Russ Faria. So the story goes like this, Russ Faria, is uh, accused of murdering his wife. And uh, he comes home from a night out and sees his wife laying there dead and calls the police. He gets interrogated and they didn't do any real investigation. They just said, you did it. So he sits in prison, waits his trial and is convicted. So Jules Schwartz is his lawyer and works on making sure he gets an appeal. While this is all going on, there's a woman, Pam Hupp, who drove home Betsy Faria. She's the last person to see her and she starts just being crazy and uh, along the way allegedly kills a few other people to try to cover up this story. So it's an amazing story and uh, I've been following it again since the Dateline uh, aired a couple years back, but now there's the thing about Pam on NBC starring Renee Zellweger and Joel Schwartz, the lawyer for Russ Faria, is played by Josh Dumel. It's unbelievable. So um, we're gonna hear from uh, J uh, Joel here in a moment. Hopefully if uh, you're interested in the thing about Pam and everything that happened with Pam Hupp, I'm I mean, I can't get enough. I, 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 I just think she's crazy and I love it and I enjoy it, uh, allegedly crazy. So uh, I'm gonna take a quick break. I'm gonna show you a little bit about some of the people that have been on the show here and then uh, I'm gonna bring in Joel. It's Mick Foley. Oh my goodness, you're gonna be in St. Louis at the Helium Comedy Club on September 7th, September 8th. Charlie Barons, there he is over there. Again, if you watch here in St. Louis, he's coming here to Helium. Um, you're going all across the Midwest. We do have on the phone Tom Green. And we, was this there is enough? great. We you did a great job. Great interview. Absolutely. Come see my shows this weekend starting tonight at Helium uh, here in St. Louis. That is Greg Fitzsimmons. Well, and then I was in St. Louis, I did the Helium Club. March 4th and March 5th. It's Mike Malloy. There's Mike Malloy. Hello, Mike Malloy. You're going to be in St. Louis and having some Helium. I am. I'm very excited about it. Jim Florentine is my guest. Well, you're here in St. Louis, you're doing some more stand-up. You can take a look at jimflorentine.com for all of Jim's uh, exciting news. But you're releasing a YouTube special on, uh, on Monday the 13th. Obviously, you want a Netflix deal, but you can't get that, which is limited. You put it on Netflix and people watch for free and you'll see a lot more people will see it. This is sort of what you guys all do, right? It's like, hey, I'm going to do some stand-up, I'm going to do some videos, I'm going to do a podcast. The days are gone when you can just be a stand-up comedian. One of my regrets is I didn't stick around TNA longer. Uh, Hulk and I had a, a dramatic face-off in the ring and I was thinking, oh, we could have a match. Mike Malloy, MikeMalloy.com. You can obviously find him on Twitter. He's going to be at Helium in St. Louis on March 4th and March 5th. I think originally you told investigators that when you left, Betsy was lying on the couch. Is that correct? I know she was on the couch because she was put. She was going to put in a boot. Okay. Who else might you have lied to? Ms. Anybody Hunt? that would bug me and bug me and bug me and bug me. Did the detectives bug you and bug you? Yeah. So you might have lied to them. No. All right. So now uh, you've seen the uh, the fun, I guess, the oddity of Pan Hup, Pam Hup. And now we bring in uh, the lawyer for uh, Russ Faria, Joel Schwartz, played uh, stunningly by Josh Dumal. <laughs> you look just like him. How do you think he's portraying you on the, on the NBC show? Oh, I am I'm so thrilled and honored to have Josh playing me. And uh, it's interesting to watch because I see these things and I guess I don't notice a lot of my own mannerisms. But people who know me well seem to think he's got my mannerisms down pat. And you think he's doing a wonderful job. 
Well, let's let's talk about that. First, first of all, thank you for joining me. Um, and uh, Bone Deep is a book that you wrote about this whole uh, crazy ten years or so. But uh, how did you, did Josh come to meet you? Have you guys had conversations so he could kind of get the mannerisms down? There's not a lot of not a lot of TV of you, right, out there. I mean, obviously you can see trials and stuff. But tell me a little bit about how he. Yeah, there's a considerable amount, but then I don't think he watched any of that. We uh, initially engaged on Zoom and met a few times and had some discussions. Um, he knew some things about me before we met. Uh, you know, he knew I, I'm surprised they used it, but he knew I played guitar in a band and sang. And he, uh, I guess he'd been given a bunch of information by the writer of the show. So we did some Zooms. And then as watchers or viewers of the show started, I don't want to spoil anything for those who haven't seen it, but I am actually in episode two. Um, so after I filmed that, he and I spent a, couple of days getting to know one another and hanging out. And then I went back there for another weekend and we spent some more time together. So he is, and we communicate, we continue to communicate. So we become friends. Uh, he's a great guy and I'm, I'm happy for him and all the success he's having. Okay. Now you said he, he you are in episode two. Does that mean you actually, or Josh is part of, I, I, cause I've watched episode two. I'm, I can't get enough of this, by the way. Are you actually in it? Do you do like a walk by no, a little bit more than that. Uh, you know when they're in the bar. Yeah. And she says, Schwartz thinks he's going to keep murderers out on his wife, murderers on the street, but this one's going away for life. Something along those lines. They do a, a situation where they freeze on the cop walking by, and then they freeze on a guy named Juror Number Two. I don't know if you recall that. That's the back of my head fixing a drink. And then I turn around, and the judge asks me for a drink. And I look over at her, I ignore her, and I kind of move on about my business. So it's about a three-second uh, little cameo that I had. And it was a lot of fun. And my nieces and nephews have watched the thing about 10 different times. It's pretty funny. Well, I mean, the show is 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 great. Um, I, I like the way they're putting a, a – well, it's weird to have this sort of com- dark comedy spin on this whole story. But it's so insane I don't think there's any other way to put it out there. I mean, Dateline has given it its obvious news slant. So if you're going to have Renee Zellweger and Josh Duhamel and all these stars, you sort of have to give it this dark comedy Fargo type thing because it's almost unbelievable, right? I mean, that that's what I'm once once I've kind of let that soak over me that this is not going to be a documentary style show that we're, we're you know, and Pam is not a real uh, likable character. Um, you you kind of have to have that dark comedy in there, I guess, right? Seemingly to you. Well, I, I didn't know how they were going to sell it or how they were going to make it. And then I uh, saw the previews along with everybody else. And I had been speaking to the what they call the showrunner, Jenny Klein, uh, who, by the way, has just been wonderful. And she kind of talked me through what they were doing. So what it's done is they're staying true to the facts, yet they're giving it a humorous spin. Um, it's not a comedy, and, and it is dark. Um, I, I think it's sort of just as kooky as Pam is. They're doing it. This is the thing about Pam, and it's Pam's view. And, uh, you know, Rennell Zellweger is absolutely incredible playing Pam. There have been, I've noticed, some detractors regarding the seriousness nature of the story and how this murder is not funny. For those people who want the actual facts behind the story, they can go and read my book called Bone Deep untangling the murder of Betsy Faria and it gets into all the facts and there's no comedy about it at all. And it gets into the players and their histories. Um, I love the show and what they indicated to me, they were not going to just do dateline drama. They were going to make it interesting, entertaining. And I think they've achieved their goal. Yeah, that Pam likes to drink sodas at big gulps, doesn't she? According to this. Um, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, and she certainly does. And it's kind of humorous. Well, your book I started reading today and uh, just kind of just breezing through it because, again, I, I'm all things about it. It's a crazy story, and it is. It literally is just – it starts on December 27th, 2011. You see the text messages that were being sent um, in their entirety, so it's really fact-based and just kind of takes you through the timeline. What made you want to write the book, uh, and how long did it take? And I know you had a writer with you, but just tell me uh, – all the details about this book. And by the way, you can get it wherever you get books. I'm Kindles and uh, anywhere you get books, I'm sure you can tell us if there's a place you'd like us to get it from. But just give me the whole background of wanting to write a book about it. Well, to start with, you can get it where you can, you can get it on Amazon. You can get it on Audible. Uh, you can go to any bookstore. 
I, it, it was just a story that was, I'm not a writer. I've never written a book. It, it was a story that was begging to be told. It had to be told because nobody would believe it happened. Um, when I first wrote it along with Mr. Bosworth, who is an experienced writer, we went back and forth and we wrote this thing. And uh, one of the first people who read it was my uncle, who is, uh, he was an Ivy League graduate. He's very successful and he loved it. He did say one caveat is this, if this was fiction, I would have put it down easily a hundred pages into it because frankly, it's just not believable that this could have happened. Well, I'm here to tell you it happened and I still can't believe it happened. And when I, I, I've, I've listened to my book, I wanted to hear the person they hired to read it. I've read the manuscript and I've read the book once it, once it had come out. I think I've read it two or three times. And every time I read it, I just can't fathom that it happened. And I know it happened because I lived it for the last decade. If you think about the depravity of this woman, setting aside the series, setting aside the book, we know she took this man, Lewis Gumpenberger, because she's pled guilty to that. And she spent some time with him. And remember what she was doing. She was out hunting for a human being to serve her purposes in order to deflect any sort of investigation into her back towards Rosferia. She hunted and she found a man who had been damaged by a car accident. They said he had the level of, I think it was a fifth grader. She talked to him, she drove with him in her car, and then she unloaded a revolver into him to kill him. Prior to that, she had taken a woman who, by all accounts, was not her best friend, but who she convinced the police was her best friend. And she plunged a knife into her. Now, she hasn't been convicted of that, but she's charged with that. Which is, by the way, crazy that we're still not even done with that case. That still happened. I couldn't believe it because I like, wait a minute, she's she's in jail. Oh, wait, that's for the other murder. It, it's crazy. Well, to digress for a moment, it took a new prosecutor getting in. And that's why this holds the Dateline record by two episodes and there'll be another one after Pam's trial. There's going to be at least, I think, seven Dateline episodes regarding this one case. So to get back to my train of thought, she plunged a knife into this woman over 50 times. That's, I, I can't imagine plunging a knife into an individual. I, and I, fly, I just can't imagine that. Now, if we get back, and she hasn't been charged, and I have to be very clear on what I'm saying here, but she testified out of the hearing of the jury, when we got into some of the bit I was allowed to get to, even though it was out of the hearing of the jury, like I said, that she finally had set up a trust for Betsy's daughters, because for those who don't know, four days prior to this gruesome murder, she, Betsy, for whatever reason, signed over her insurance proceeds to Pam. She then created a trust for the kids two years later, which just happened to coincide with the week prior to our trial. Now, on the stand, she testified under oath the reason it took her so long was because her mother had been sick with Alzheimer's and she'd been taking care of her and her mother had just recently died of Alzheimer's. Well, surprise, surprise, the day the trial's over, I got about six calls saying her mother did not die of Alzheimer's. Her mother fell off the third floor balcony of a retirement community. So I said, Scott, the, that county's police involved. They're looking into it. And what happened is her mother, Pam was the last one with her. Her mother had 14 times the recommended dose of Ambien in her system and was somehow the bars or the value strides of the railing had been dislodged and they were found underneath the woman and some of them had been bent out. So someone had to take this woman who weighed over 200 pounds, roll her to the railing, and then force her through, like squishing her through these things. If it was in fact Pam, the action of doing that to a human being, let alone at your mother, is just a level of depravity that I can't even begin to fathom. Yeah, how, I never get where. Uh, maybe you can help me here. Where? How did Betsy get? convinced that Pam should have that insurance. I've never seen the reasoning. I know there was, oh, you know, you know, she was fighting with Russ or whatever. But what was, how did she work that over to get Pam? She, she I, and I can't answer that question. Um, I have several points of conjecture. She was not fighting at Russ at the time. She believed she had been diagnosed with a terminal illness. Not she believed that she had been. And she only had a certain period of time to live. 
she wanted to save for those girls, her two daughters, and she believed in Russ's grief. He would spend it on them. He would buy them cars. He would buy them whatever he wanted because they were soon to be motherless. Um, so she wanted somebody to be able to take that money. And she had been asking her family members if they would take that one policy of hers and use it for the daughters and create a trust when they're older. Pam got wind of that. And I've always believed that Pam either forged her or tricked her into signing this because we knew Betsy was going to meet Pam that day. And Betsy had told at least one close friend of hers that Pam was pressing her about something, but we don't know what it makes sense. that It was the insurance policy. I think Pam, I think Betsy was either having second thoughts or didn't want anyone else to know, which is why it had to be done so quickly, simply because the beneficiary would be noticed and notified that the policy benefit, that the, I'm sorry, the insurer would be noticed that the beneficiary of the policy would be changed. And that would have happened sometime very quickly. So this caper, this plot of Pam's to kill Betsy had to be pulled off and had to be pulled off immediately. And it was. This, if she signed it on Friday, she was killed on Tuesday. Do you, so on to Russ, do you think the detectives thought he did it? Or is it one of those things where, and I've, now you see this on Netflix, thank, thank God for Netflix, where they want to have the, the person named and charged so they can be done. It's hey, it's too it's easier. We don't have to really do any detective work. You know, Sean Avery making a murderer real quick. Ryan Ferguson, the Columbia case, is, both are huge Netflix shows, and that's what I think about when I see this case. As I as I read the beginning of your book, as I've watched the the Datelines, they had no evidence, right? I mean, they had nothing connecting Russ to this. There was no DNA. There's not. I mean, in, in, from what I see, right? So did they just say? Hey, let's just let's plan put him in and be him. He can be the guy that we charge. Did, or do you do you think they believe that, or it was just easy because hey, this is the husband, you know, and we're done. I think all. I think the answer to your long question is yes to all accounts. I think that they originally decided it was him. It became groupthink, and then it became confirmation bias, and anything that didn't fit to confirm their bias, they simply discarded. Uh, had Russ called me the night he was arrested or had he called any responsible criminal attorney, they would have said, shut your mouth. I'll see you in a half hour. I'll see you tomorrow morning. What he did for the next 36 hours in the effort to help them quote unquote, find Betsy's killer was tell them every step along the way, everything, every place he went, everywhere he, everyone he talked to, what they were able to do while he was being held though, during those 36 hours was confirm his alibi, was to confirm the clothes he was wearing that didn't have any blood on them, was to confirm receipts in his car and that he stopped to get a sandwich and confirm by cell site what time he got home. They were able to prove, or he was able to prove, he could not have possibly done this. And that was within the first three to six hours. To go further into question, I cannot answer why to this day. It's unfathomable to, fathomable to me that there wasn't some sort of cooler head in the room. And when I say the room, I mean the entire police department, the entire prosecutor's office to step back and say, hold on, let's, let's just wait a minute. This guy has no blood on him. He was with four people throughout the night. We know what time he got home. There was a seat in his car, his cell site. Everything is confirmed. This woman, she has motive. Nobody's ever investigated her. Nobody knows her whereabouts, and she continues to lie every single time she opens her mouth. You say that Betsy lied to you. Is yes. that what you said? Yes. Do you have anything in writing from Betsy that indicates that? In writing? Yes. No. We were not having an affair or anything like that that you would send cards and stuff. I mean, I got cards from her, say, love Betsy. I presented those things to the prosecutor. It fell on deaf ears. It continued to fall on deaf ears. And then with the court rulings, I was not able to get into all of her lies, what are called in court prior inconsistent statements. In Pam's case, we'll just call them out now, lies. Um, nor was I able to get into her being the beneficiary of Betsy's life insurance. So the jury was able to hear that because we had an incompetent judge who had incompetent rulings, and we had an ill-informed and uninformed jury that convicted him. It's, it's crazy how that happened. And then you see in the show, if you just watch the show, the, the the judge and the DA knew each other. They you know banned and all. It's just crazy. How soon? Um, I mean, Russ. I think has had a cousin that knew to call you. But how soon do you go? This sounds like it's 
this woman that drove her home. I mean, how quickly in your mind does it compute that there's no way it's Russ? How quickly did that did the Pam kind of become your just suspect in your mind? Well, as the series seems to portray, there is a healthy you have to go into this with a healthy healthy dose of skepticism and cynicism when you meet your client. Many, many clients will lie to you. Um, first, let me say I didn't bring my guitar to meet my client, as it's depicted in the series. Um, but I went to meet him, and the story he gave not only was his sincerity sincerity noticeable, he included several other people. It was so verifiable that as we walked out, the way they depicted is true. It's like I, I was talking to my assistant, Nate. And I'm going to be able to tell you within a day whether or not his story checks out. We checked out with the alibi witnesses. We checked with the receipt from Arby's. We checked the videos. Within a matter of days, it all checked out. I was, I, and I knew at that point in time I had a good defense. And then I got the police reports, and there were no surprises. And this is a true story. They didn't. It's in the book, and I get into it, but they didn't depict it in the show. My son, my oldest son, was in seventh grade at the time. So I got home, and I wanted to see, what am I missing? I have to be missing something. It's just not that simple. I read the police reports as I'm reading them. My cute little smart son said, Dad, can I help? He had never helped me before on a case. And I said, sure. And he sat down next to me and diligently read reports for 30 to 45 minutes. In conclusion, he looked up at me, and he said, all right, Dad, I got it. I know who did it. It was that simple. Why there wasn't a cop in the room to be as intelligent as my son is beyond me, and which is why we're here and you and I are having this conversation 10 years after the fact. Yeah. Uh, so there are other things that are very odd to me that happened. I know that there's a lot hidden from the jury, but the fact that they turned it, that these four people that he was with Oh, they all have the same story and they're lying. And then the one that always is weird to me, and I have to ask, you know, this is where I'm asking for advice. Hopefully this is free. When you make a 911 call after seeing your wife dead on the floor, what are you supposed to sound like? And that, that is crazy to me. That's, that's a great question. You have to call Leah Askey and say, how am I supposed to sound when I do that? Because for the whole, the, the entire period, she said, oh, he's faking it. And then they put on a 911 supervisor and I objected because... In 33 years of trying cases, I've never seen anything like this. But this incompetent judge allowed the supervisor to opine that she believed he was lying as well. And she'd heard so many calls. And it's it's beyond me what you're supposed to act like when you find your spouse dead on the floor. Um, but they went on and on and on. And it's crazy. And that actually was part of the evidence. And that was actually part of her argument. In addition to the four alibi witnesses... Russ went over there. They said hello. It was after Christmas. They weren't going to play their game. They sat down, talked for two minutes, and then watched a movie. There's no different stories. I don't know what else they could have possibly told. But one thing that really made me angry was the prosecutor asked them, and this is out of bounds in a criminal trial. She says, isn't it true that you refuse to take a polygraph to the alibi witnesses? Number one, you're not allowed to do it. Number two, and much, much more importantly, they had all volunteered to take polygraphs. So the jury heard this. I objected. The jury was instructed to disregard the information. But once the cat's out of the bag, you can't unring that bell, to use two bad metaphors um, or a mixed metaphor. And so the jury heard these things. And I still, to this day, don't know what the jury was thinking, because even though I couldn't get into Pam Hub as an alternate suspect or as the we commonly do term, and the series is correct, some other dude did it, the Saudi defense, they didn't hear any of that. There still no, was no evidence that Russ Faria could have done it. And, and I guess the other question I have is if, if someone, because I, I just, it, it's just so scary to me that the system is like this, that you can go in and just be answering questions and then they can charge you. What is the best, I guess you've already mentioned it, if you know that you haven't done anything, because Russ, you see all these tapes and he's saying, I didn't do it. The Ryan Ferguson case at, at Mizzou, he's just saying, I didn't do it. I, you know, and I don't know how many other times you can say that. So I guess the best thing to do, call Joel, right? Is that what we do? You shut your mouth and you call. Now, in this case, Russ did essentially immunize himself in that 
maybe those videotapes of him stopping to get gas wearing the same clothes would have been gone had he waited to talk to me or waited a week and we went to the police. Um, and it is interesting you mentioned the Ryan Ferguson case. Ryan's case is a typical example of how long it takes when a jury makes a mistake. His case, he was locked up for over a decade. That man lost his 20s. And I've spoken at different functions along with Ryan and Russ and Ryan have become good friends. And that is, that's another one of those cases. He's a great young man. The fact that as a kid, he, that he was convicted of this, it's, these tales are cautionary, they're frightening. And when you have prosecutors whose sole goal is not justice, but is to win, that's where the problem comes in. In my case, and in I think Ryan's case, in this case, Leah Askey, she only wanted to win. She wanted to beat me. Justice was never served. And it's still hard for me. She's still out there saying that she believes Russ is the guy. And it's just hard for me to fathom that any halfway intelligent human being or, or even any stupid human being could believe that for a second. Yeah. I mean, this is the book is Bone Deep. Joel Schwartz, uh, the lawyer for Russ Faria, he wrote the book along with uh, Mr. Bosworth. Uh, I'm going to read it. I have a, I have a, f- a flight here on Sunday. I'm going to read the rest of it. I, I'm, I, I thought I've heard everything I needed to hear, but I get into the book and now I'm like, I can't, I can't put this down. So Bone Deep, you can get that anywhere. What's it like um, hearing Keith Morrison say your name, having conversations with him? And Russ's lawyer, Joel, had a different interpretation of that call. Of course, he's biased. But when I asked him about it, he said two things stuck out to him the first time he heard it. He's creepy. I'm scared of him, Joel. I think you need to look into him. <laughs> Keith Morrison is one of the nicest human beings I've ever met. I will tell you, when I first met him, I knew the voice. And we this was 2013 when we met. And I said to Keith, you'll be back. He said, he humored me and said, I hope so. Great. Well, he was back because we got it overturned faster than your, your head could spin. And he came back and he said, you know, Joel, everybody says I'm going to win on the PL. And everybody says, you'll be back. I am so thrilled that I'm back. And I'm surprised that I'm back. Well, he came back then. He then came back after we won the trial. He then came back after Pam was charged. We've done five episodes. He's been back five times. We had dinner in New York because our episode was the premiere of the season uh, two years ago. And it's now become a running joke because he came back again to film a sixth episode. Um, so, and, and he's wonderful. It's, it is eerie when he says, Joel, he's made it sort of a two syllable word. Um, I enjoy it. I'm having fun. And boy, are my friends and family giving me all kinds of grief, but I'm loving it. And I think they are too. Yeah. And I'll promote their podcast. Uh, it's so, it's so great. Cause Keith does the voice of it. It's called the thing about Pam six episodes. Um, what Pam is, she, what, what do we think of her mentally? I mean, she didn't seem to have any sort of background before all this. She did work in insurance. It seemed like she got these ideas. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, insurance policies. Like, what, what, where do you think she went wrong? What, in your mind, just as a, a guy who's now had to deal with her for so many years? You know, Gree's a crazy thing. She saw Betsy as a patsy, an easy mark, and Russ is sort of, she underestimated Russ. Russ is, Russ is a smart guy. He's a little rough around the edges, but I think she kind of determined, all right, this is a, some, well, she was right. This is a, a country police department, I'll be able to do this, and they'll never catch me. Any, it was it was as simple as, had they had Encyclopedia Brown on the case, any, any seventh grade team of individuals looking at this, it was so simple as to who had done it. I don't know how she got away with it. She's not brain damaged. She's not uh, what they say, incompetent in court, meaning you don't understand the wrongfulness of your conduct or you can't insist on your defense. She's just devious and she's greedy. And the fact that she got away with it, she got bolder and bolder and bolder. But if you notice, she only picked on weak people. Betsy was weak with chemo. Uh, Louis Gumpenberger had his accident. And the other person was her 200 and something pound mother who was in a walker. How, so as, as you talk about your career as a criminal defense attorney, there are 
people that this is their calling, where they go, Kathleen Zellner is a big name, where she, this is her, her deal. Is she made herself very famous by finding people that have been tried wrong. It's got to be hard, though, because a lot of times you're going to find someone that it's, it, they did it, right? So how hard is it to do what you do when it's going to be hard to believe them or you, you might not be able to do what you want to do? You know, I mean, you have to, I've heard other defense attorneys say, listen, my job is to make sure they don't go to jail. That, that's why I'm, I'm hired. Tell me a little bit about just this process for you. Brad, that's a great question, and I agree with those people. My job is not the same as a prosecutor's. My their job is justice. My job is to defend my clients as best I, as I can, and to defend their rights. Um, I don't judge them. Now, oftentimes, I don't even want to know. I don't give an opinion as to whether or not they did it, and I don't want to be as callous as to say I don't care. Um, I care. I'm, I'm a human being. But at the same time, I set that care aside and I do my job. And the concern is not whether or not they did it. The concern is what the state can and cannot prove. And if I do my job and I can keep the state from proving those charges beyond a reasonable doubt, then I sleep fine at night. Uh, I enjoy this. It's always a challenge. And if they did it, they should be punished uh, unless shortcuts were taken. And in this particular case, I can't imagine that you could find something that had more shortcuts taken. I don't understand to this day why nobody looked into Pam Hub. What we had is nobody looked into her whereabouts beyond me. I mean, let's not forget, I could prove that at the time of the homicide of this brutal stabbing of Betsy Faria, that Pam was still there. Jury didn't get to hear that. What Pam told them is she was home at the time. I verified that was a complete out and out lie. Why I'm able to do that and nobody says, you know what, Schwartz is right. She was there. Why don't we investigate? Why don't we at least confirm the clothes she was wearing? Why don't we have a conversation with her husband, her son, the rest of her family? Anybody who stands, who, who, who has the opportunity to benefit from what she did, well, they talk to nobody. They confirm nothing. And they did actually go to interview her husband, and I talk about it in the book. He answered in a 30-minute interview, he answered two questions. She kept interjecting. This man, Russ, who she barely knew, who was a nice, who was a nice enough guy, every time she opened her mouth, he became meaner, he became more abusive, he became more threatening. And over the years, as the story evolved, he had threatened to kill her. Uh, again, we go into all that in the book. And I think here is the best example of what I could give. Two of my partners, I signed copies of the book for them, and I gave them everyone in my office. And they said, do I really need to read this? I know everything. And they both read and came back to me and they keep asking questions because neither of them had any idea to the depths of what I went through. One said he would have had a heart attack. The other said I would have gotten arrested. Uh, it's just unfathomable and unthinkable. And it, I like to think and I, the, the reviews have been wonderful and people are saying it reads like fiction. I like to think that that's true and that it's an easy read. And I hope you enjoy it, Brad, when you read Bondi. Yeah, stranger than fiction, they should say. I have one more, couple, yeah. couple, couple, two more questions for you uh, before we go here. Because um, I, I, I get so angry when I watch these shows, when the interrogation and the... I've really changed my mind. I mean, I, I'm pro-law enforcement. I'm not pro-criminal. I want to make, make sure that people don't go out and loot and steal, whatever. But boy, do I get angry when you watch these things and you get interrogated. And I know that the job is to get a confession. I'm curious, have you watched, and, and kind of two parts that, and then the making of a murder. I don't know if, you know, you do this for a living. I'm sure you don't want to sit at home and watch trials on a, you know, 16-hour Netflix special. But I'm curious if you've watched that and thoughts on uh, Stephen Avery's uh, kind of years of, of issues he's had during that Making a Murderer show on Netflix? Well, two things. The, the, when they were hammering Russ, it doesn't come anywhere near the questioning. There were three of them. They were nose to nose screaming at him to attempt to get a confession. And he kept denying and denying. It went on for about 45 minutes, screaming at the top of their lungs in his face. Making a Murderer. I was watching it, and more specifically, and I don't remember his nephew's name, who got convicted originally. Um, I was watching it on, I think, Netflix, and I was sitting there. I got so angry. I started to shiver, and I was cold. It was December. I was watching it, and I put a blanket around me, and I was still shivering, and I was so mad what they were doing to this poor kid. Um, 
And then I couldn't get warm. Well, it turns out I was sick. I actually got had an infection and had to go in the hospital the next morning. I blame that confession. It made me so angry. And I think he, his case has been overturned, hasn't it? No. The nephew? The nep- uh, I don't, I, maybe the nephew, but definitely not Stephen. Yeah, I know Stephen hasn't. It's, you know, and then I watched it in that episode with the key where they searched that mobile home, that little bitty space. It was, you know, they, knowing what I know, do I believe that those police planted that key in there? 100 percent. I have no doubts that that was planted because all the other cops who had the right to do it and search the place couldn't find that key. And the ones who weren't allowed to participate happened to find a key. The sad thing is, you know, I grew up and I thought I knew the ways of the world. Uh, I started doing this and somebody said, well, a police officer would lie. A police officer would plant evidence. Prosecutors can be a corrupt. And I, and I would respond with like, that makes no sense to me. Why would anyone do that? If they don't have enough to convict somebody, what do they care? They just need to do their job. Well, I've been doing this 33 years now and human beings are what they are. This the Faria case is a perfect example of how the system is designed to work and doesn't work because the human beings involved either don't know what they're doing, a la the judge, or simply want to win. Or in the cop's case, they want to confirm and they want to be right. Um, and that's how we end up with so many innocent people in prison. And I'm in agreement with you. I'm, I, I, I believe in law enforcement. I'm not pro-crime. At the same time, in doing this 33 years, I've sat across the table from thousands upon thousands of people, many, many guilty, some innocent. Whether you're guilty or innocent, I still can't imagine. I can't put, I don't have the empathy to put myself in their shoes and imagine what it's like to be facing the prospect of going to live in a cage for a night, a year, or the rest of my life. It's it's really, really difficult especially in a situation like this where, if we remember this, Russ Faria showed up at home innocently enough after spending a night with his friends. His wife is brutally murdered in a pool of blood on the carpet. He doesn't even have time to grieve. He's taken, he's brought to the station, and now he then has to defend himself because he's facing, and he was sentenced to, life imprisonment without the possibility of parole originally. It's frightening. Yeah, it scares me. And then I always I keep bringing up the Ryan Ferguson thing. If you want to get angry or watch that, the judge is still in Missouri. It's in our state. It sucks. Three quick ones. Have you seen the full show now? Have you seen all the episodes? Are you watching it as it happens? I watch it as it happens. Um, I obviously have a little bit more insight than most. Um, the producer and the showrunner contact me, and I communicate with Josh. He He's seen them all, and he tells me... Um, I'm really going to be happy with episode three, and I'm going to be even happier with episode four. And again, you know, I knew I was playing guitar in episode two. I didn't know I was carrying it near the motel. Um, but so I have a little bit more than most. But, I, you know, I'm watching it along with my family and friends and everybody else. It's kind of fun that way. Yeah. And what do you, where do you play out? And what's the band's name? Let's promote everything, right? Well, I can't say the band's name. Well, it's not public, but it's, it's Joel's effing band. Oh, okay. Um, and, then, and we do play out. But we really just play charity functions and we play at parties and things like that. We don't, I'm not, I don't go play at bars. I'm not out for hire and I don't, I can't stay up till three in the morning playing at a bar. I have a lot of fun with it. It's more of a creative outlet. Uh, I also do a little bit of acting and things like that. And it's just a way, because of the serious nature of what I do every day, it's fun to, to get out and do something different. And then the practice where you are is uh, well-known, great holiday parties. Uh, tell us just what it's like working over there with the, the guys you work with. You guys have some fun. I think it feels like the Wolf of Wall Street of uh, St. Louis lawyers, huh? And did you, get a, did you get a chance to talk? Did you want to be part of the Rams case? I don't, I don't know if you had a chance. We, uh, we did not. Uh, we did whenever the Rams were here and they had issues. We always defended them. My partners, uh, Scott Rosenblum, Matt Fry. John Rogers are clearly the best attorneys in town. Well, and I like to think myself in that group. And we do get the bulk of the serious cases around town. Um, and we do have a lot of fun. And our Christmas party has become uh, what people have termed the party of the year. And up until this year in COVID, my band played for the party. We played, you know, five hours throughout the party. And it has become quite the event. And uh, all the local celebrities show up. And we have a, everybody lets loose. It's the Friday. It's always been the Friday before Christmas and we have a good time. And my partners and the associates have all become my good friends. And, uh, 
it makes it a lot easier to practice and deal with the stress that we go through when you like the people you work with. Yeah. Well, again, I'm going to finish this book. You got me started. I'm hooked. I'm in it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I have to read this whole thing. Uh, Bone Deep is the name of it. You can find it again where it's sold. Have, is there anything else you'd like to mention here before we say goodbye? This has been very entertaining for me. Uh, I can't wait to read the book. Anything else you'd like to mention? No, Brad, I appreciate your time. And it's Bone Deep, Untangling the Bessie Faria Murder. Um, there is, I, I have these friends who vacation in Florida and uh, they know two authors. They know me. And you know this guy named, uh, he does, writes the Doc Ford series. His name is Randy Wayne White. He also wrote a book recently called Bone Deep. So the funny part is they know two authors and they both wrote Bone Deep. So make sure your listeners get Bone Deep, Untangling the Betsy Faria Murder Case. I was going to say that you never, I don't know what that other book might be about. It could be something very strange. I'm just saying. I, I haven't read it, but he, he signed a copy for me. Why, why, so is, it called, why is it called Bone Deep? I, now I have to ask. Why is my book called that? Yeah. Oh, because the stab wounds? Oh, hate... The stab wounds go bone deep and then the slit in the wrist. That, I mean, that to me, I think that's what set it off. Was Russ came home and he called in because this was suicide. And part of it was she had been suicidal at times. And there was a massive gash up to the bone in her wrist. Can't do that. Yeah, you can't do that with suicide, I would think. But I'm not a forensic person. Yeah, but you know, you're not. I, I, you know, again, your earlier question: How are you? What are you supposed to say when you call in and you find your wife? I don't. Hopefully, none of us can ever answer that question. That's exactly it. And again, I, that's what I was trying to convey here with people watching, because I, I watch these things. I get angry when I see the interrogations. So hopefully, this has helped people if they ever get in his, and, and they think back to that interview with Brad and Joel. They'll say, "That's right. Call Joel." And make sure that I have, uh, you know, a lawyer here. So I, I thank you. Uh, and I thank you for watching again. It's uh, Here's the Pitch. Uh, it's sponsored by Masses Restaurants, five locations, stlmasses.com. We'll see you next time.